Hi friends, welcome to the Share, Invite, Proclaim channel. My name is Judy. I'd like to talk briefly about the unusual ending of chapter 11, uh, verses 32 to 40. It's unusual and it's hard to find commentators who will say anything about it other than just repeat the words that are written in scripture. Well, after praying and thinking and mulling over and letting the Lord speak. Uh, I'm going to talk about these unique uh, verses. Well, in chapter 11, verse 32, after the list of men and women that are, are that um, the writer of Hebrews speaks about, these Old Testament greats, he praises the faithful in general terms. He says in verse 33, who by faith conquered kingdoms, that could be David, performed acts of righteousness, that could be Samuel, obtained promises, well, that could be Gideon because God told him that he would not die, shut the mouths of lions, uh, that sounds like Samson, Verse 34, quenched the power of fire. Maybe that's Samuel. Um, whoopsie. Escaped the edge of the sword. Well, that would be all of those military men like David, Barak, and Jeph Jephthah. I wish I knew how to say his name. From weakness were made strong. Gideon said, well, I'm the weakest in my family, in my tribe is the weakness of all the tribes or Barak who said I'll go into battle if you Deborah will go with me if you don't go with me I I won't go into battle <laughs> become mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight well that still could be those military uh, people like Barak Samson Jeph Jephthah and David well what persecutions did these Old Testament and New Testament heroes face. Verse 35, women receive back their dead by resurrection. It reminds me of Jesus uh, resurrecting Jairus' daughter or the boy uh, that he resurrects so that his mother would not become a beggar or a street lady. Some were tortured, beaten to death, preferring to die rather than um, turn from God and deny the resurrection of Christ. Whipped, chained in dungeons, stoned to death, saw none too. Promised freedom if they would deny their faith. Killed with a sword, they lost their homes and, and a livelihood, making them to wander over mountains and deserts, and hiding in caves and holes in the ground, hungry and sick. And I wonder if there's any uh, New Testament writer that talks about these specifically think these specific things from the first to the third century or fourth century. Now, no one would want to die in any of these ways if they didn't believe in God and see Jesus Christ in their future and the reward of heaven, and that was greater than their sufferings. Now, first, verses 39 and 40 are the confusing words. And all of these, talking about all those that he discussed in chapter 11, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Now, just reading that doesn't really make sense until you... until you study it a little bit more. Verse 39, and all of these, the women and the men that he uh, talks about uh, who experienced sufferings and persecution because of their faith in Christ, they would not deny Christ. They were willing to suffer for their belief in Christ. Their relationship with God through Jesus Christ was greater than their sacrifices. And all these, having gained God's approval through their faith. Verse 13 of that chapter talks about they saw the promises of God 
from a distance, having gained God's approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. What was promised to them? Well, Jesus Christ as the Messiah to live in the land of promise or the holy land, verse 9, waiting for a heavenly city that was planned and built by God, verses 10 and 16. They were temporary travelers on earth, verse 13. And then in verse 13, Abraham offered up Isaac as his only begotten son. He was a type or a picture of Jesus as God's only begotten son, said by God at the baptism of Jesus. All of these, having gained God's approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Having gained God's approval through their faith, uh, they did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us. Now, if us refers to these apostles, this is written in AD 70. Well, if it's a referring to the apostles, God providing something better, well, these apostles knew Jesus face to face, not from a distance. They followed Jesus for his three-year ministry. They witnessed his death, his burial, and his resurrection. They witnessed the 50 days after the resurrection, before he ascended into heaven. Uh, we're approaching Pente Pentecost Sunday, and that's the day that Jesus ascended. Or if us means something better for all believers, if that's a reference to all believers, then something better is a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ through his sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the bridge that provides this personal relationship between a holy God and sinful mankind. Also, a better benefit for us is the Holy Spirit immediately enters our heart when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Well, we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin that's by the work of the Holy Spirit. He lived a sinless life. He was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven and sat at the honored position of the right hand of God. And Jesus Christ is coming again. We call it the second coming. He's returning to earth with all believers to defeat Satan and Satan's followers and throw them into hell. Jesus Christ then would usher in a new heaven and a new earth, and we are reunited with our loved ones and all believers from the beginning of time. And then the last phrase of verse 40. God provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Well, what on earth does that mean? Well, apart from us, maybe... Here, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the apostles. They would not reach perfection without us. Well, it has a reference to Revelation 6, 11, which says that Jesus Christ broke the fifth seal, which is about martyrs, which fits all of these writers that Hebrews mentions. In verse 10 of Revelation 6, they cried out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, how long will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who are on earth? Verse 11, each were given a white robe and they were told they should not, they, that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they were, would be complete also. So from John's revelation, Many more would become martyrs, and judgment would not happen until the last of these martyrs were killed by unbelievers. Now, the martyrdom of the writer of Hebrews speaks from AD 33 to AD 70. From the death of Christ, his ascension, and the coming of the Holy Spirit will continue to happen throughout history until the second coming of Christ, when Christ will judge the living and the dead. 
Now, thousands of Christians are martyred every year, but we tend not to hear about it in America because they don't report it. The governments don't report it. I wonder how long it will happen, how long it will be before it happens in our country. Well, I think this is the best ending of chapter 11, that we have a personal relationship with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit coming inside us and that our relationship with God is, is restored because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us and that we will be reunited with other believers at the second coming when Satan and his demons will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's my interpretation anyway. If you see it some other way, let me know. Well, thanks for watching, and I look forward to beginning chapter 12 of Hebrews, and I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.